Hey folks, welcome back to Tap Tempo with me, Matt Lang. This week on the show, I have Canadian singer-songwriter Denise Reno. Denise is a longtime collaborator of mine. We originally did a song on Mousetrap called Space Between a few years ago. Most recently, we just released a song called Ordinary Love. Go check it out. But beyond me, she's done numerous singles, collaborations, and remixes on record labels such as Warner, Atlantic, Armada, Dim Mac, and like I said, Mousetrap, not to mention many others. In 2016, Denise's cover of Chris Isaac's Wicked Game went viral and ended up racking up over 30 million streams across all the streaming platforms which is no small feat. So it's my pleasure now to present to you my conversation with Denise. She is so multifaceted and talented, and she's truly a wonderful person. Hey folks, welcome back to Tap Tempo. This week on the show, I have Canadian singer-songwriter extraordinaire and collaborator Denise Reno. Uh, Her and I have a new song uh, that actually just came out called Ordinary Love. We wrote it originally two and a half years ago. 2019, then the pandemic hit, and it waited. So finally, uh, it's out now, and uh, we figured we would talk a bit about the song, and we'll talk a lot about Denise. So Denise, hi. Where are you right now? Hi, I'm in Toronto. Okay. <laughs> I'm in my condo in Toronto, yep. in a semi-lockdown. Semi, oh, that's right. Yeah. Ontario is uh, bad right now yeah that- we've gone like two steps forward like three steps back four steps right. forward six steps steps back but yeah what are what are the regulations right now um they just shut down the gyms and okay. you can't dine indoors anymore again and you know the usual and it's january so there there's not many places you can go in january just like museums and galleries and um we have a few of those as it is but now you can't do it anymore so uh but right I, I feel like I'm one of the lucky ones because I'm, I mean, I'm sitting at home working on music anyway, so it's not like I'm missing out on much. I've got my yoga mat right here. Your lifestyle is pretty self-contained, so Mm -hmm. you're easy. So let's talk about Ordinary Love because that uh, just came out just under two weeks ago. And I mean, it was September because you were here for a week, September 2019, and that's when... Mm -hmm. We did that as well as uh, a couple other tracks, which people will later hear on um, the Dichotomy album, which is soon-ish. Yay. Um, I know, right? It's been such a long time coming. But um, what when we did Ordinary, what what did it mean to you? (sighs) I feel it's like one of the few songs that I don't, I don't actually quite, remember the writing process and that that's not because you know I wasn't present for it or um or because it was long ago because I I mean I remember the writing process of some tracks that I wrote like 10 years ago but I think it it just came from a really cool place where it just like kind of came through me Mm -hmm. and like you picked that up musically and we kind of like meshed it together and it was it was one of those magical songs that just I don't know kind of appeared out of nowhere. And I think if I'm not mistaken, you already had sort of like a melody progression that we started with. Um, I don't remember if there may or may not have been other lyrics or another vocal melody on it. And then we took that away. So, um, so I had the chorus written originally and, and we had verses and the verses got scrapped entirely. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, so you rewrote the verses and then Mm -hmm. the chorus the chorus lyrics, I believe, and melody mostly stayed the same, but the rhythm, the structure of it, um, you did in a much more interesting way than I did. Mm-hmm. So that's, if I recall, that's exactly, or that's, I yeah, think, I how think, it happened. I think that's exactly what happened. And yeah. um, it was a tough week, too, because I got very, very sick. That's right. And yep. I lost my voice, which happens like once every, I think, five years. And I like completely lost it. I couldn't even talk to you. I was like, hey. You know, it it was like bad. And I remember we had like three days left and we had to track vocals for these songs. And I kind of came to a place where I thought, well, I can't, you know, it is what it is. And if it's not going to happen this time, then I'll just end up like flying to Toronto and flying back to record these tracks. And somehow I I still can't explain it, but I couldn't talk that day, but I could sing, I guess, because the voice lands in a different part of my, I don't know. Mm -hmm throat or like vocal cords um but 
for some reason, I managed to squeeze these three tracks out of me and like the vocals are beautiful. And yeah. actually, that's not, not just because I, I sang them, but it, it was like one of my favorite tracking sessions. It was just, it, it felt very, I felt like I surrendered everything because I did, because I thought yeah. like, I, I mean, I can't talk, you know, I, I don't know if I'll be able to sing, but um, I had like two cups of tea and some throat mm -hmm. spray and scarves and i was like we got to do this in uh, like I, three takes I, or something <laughs> i uh i actually yesterday i came across that because we bought the uh, the throat coat tea mm -hmm. and i still have it actually still I'm my sure favorite that's a, that's a staple because i've um i've drank that tea i think at all of like the vocal sessions I've ever done outside mm -hmm. of my own house. It's, it's, it gives me yep. comfort. I think it's a mental thing. Like if I'm at a studio, totally. I have to have that tea. And then yeah, I just like the lemon <laughs> echinacea, good. I yeah. believe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah no, no. It's uh, I bought a, re I, I got sick a month ago um, and uh, so I had a sore throat for two weeks. So mm. I, I reopened your tea and awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was helpful. You know so I was in New York a couple of months ago and I was looking for that throat spray because I feel like what actually made it possible for me to record those two songs was, was that magical mm -hmm. throat spray that I got from uh, Whole Foods. Whole Foods, yeah. And yeah. Uh, it, it's literally called like Singer's Pro or something like that. It's mm -hmm. a tiny little bottle. That stuff is magic. And I couldn't, I couldn't find it in New York. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it, there's something to be said for it. It definitely... It makes it easier to sing, like on a yeah. regular day. But mm -hmm. when you're as sick as I was that that yeah. week, it was just, I think it was a miracle cure. Like free product I, placement, that stuff is right? incredible. I mean, it was, yeah. uh, <laughs> it was a pretty incredible experience because you were in so much pain after. Yeah. I was That's, crying. I, yeah, I was literally, I remember. you remember, because you took me to a comedy show and I was crying. <laughs> yes. I was literally, everyone's laughing around me and I just like I'm crying because I'm in so much pain mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah now we can laugh about it yeah I mean it, it was fun <laughs> we we went and we saw Mark Marin. so uh, yeah which and at the time you did not like it at all <laughs> no I liked you know what I liked the first like half of it mm -hmm. and then I think the second half I was more in pain and also yeah. like his uh his flow was kind of like kind of got darker for me yes. so i was like in pain plus the energy was like off yeah. and i was just like i want to get out of here and we were like smack right in the middle of the audience and i was just like oh. <laughs> yeah it's uh and that's the day we did ordinary love as well as the other two i believe yep so yeah. ended with a bang <laughs> ended with a bang <laughs> but aside from ordinary Writing process wise, how do you usually like, cause this time of course, you know, it was different. We were, you know, basically you were literally sitting, you know, right behind me, right there, I think on the mm -hmm. floor and laying down, sleeping half the time. <laughs> there was a lot of that. Absolutely. I'm, I'm always like jet lagged when I'm at your house. This is true. <laughs> cause this I've always true. come like every single time I've been at your place, I've come from like literally across the world from Indonesia yeah. or someplace or China. Yeah. And, and I was just like, <laughs> wrapped in a blanket literally laying on the floor behind you <laughs> pretty much and somehow songs get made yeah and somehow songs get made yeah yeah but usually then what's your writing process when you're not curled up on my floor in a blanket <laughs> um what's my writing process um it kind of i don't know i i i treat songwriting as 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 an inspired process and i know that you know, some people may frown upon it and I do too sometimes that like, I'm not a writer that constantly, you know, gets up in the morning every day and starts writing and then pushes through blocks. And, um, if I feel like there's a block, I don't really work on anything. Mm -hmm. And then if I feel inspired, it could be something like I could hear somebody's new track and like a chord will inspire me and that will inspire me to sit down at a piano and like write my own chords or I will, have something happen in my life. And then I just, uh, those are the best. I find that if something happens in my life that inspires me to put all of that emotion and that story into a song, it's usually an easier process for me because I already know what I need to say. It's just sure. a matter of like, you know, I've got the paints, what are we going to do with them? Um, 
So in that case, I can sit down and I can write a complete song in like under 10 minutes because it just, it, it just flows like verse or verse chorus. Like, you know exactly what you need to say. And it's like kind of like bursting out of you. And that's why I find the, the songwriting process so gratifying is because you can say so many things that you're not maybe quite able to say, you know, to the other person or to a group of people or, mm-hmm. or as, I don't know, an Instagram post or, um, and you're able to say it in a way that's beautiful. So even if you're in pain, even if you're sad, even if something happened, um, you're able to write a song that's sad, but that's stunning at the same time. And it's sort of like, it takes, for me, it takes that element of judgment away. Like mm-hmm. if I was to just speak to the other person, would I really get all those emotions out? Would I get the message out? Um, would I get, I guess, the emotional validation I needed or whatever. But a song can be so beautiful and can transcend the original message. And that's what I find so, like, cathartic, I guess, about the process. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it can happen. I mean, sometimes literally a melody pops into my head. Sometimes I, I see a dream and I hear something in the dream and I'm like, oh, man, I wish I wrote that. That's such a great melody. And then I realize I'm... Like it's my dream, so technically mm-hmm. I wrote that. <laughs> right. So then I, try, I tried to like wake up quickly and like write it down. So yeah, it's right. It uh, it just happens. <laughs> well, it was funny because when you were um just now you were, you you made me think of something because uh, you were talking about how um when you're when you're inspired by say that action or something happened about somebody else and you know it mm-hmm. really flows right out of you. Um, I just read. Over the Christmas break, I read Juliet Naked by uh, Nick Hornby. He uh, he wrote High Fidelity and um, Election and Long Way Down and a bunch of others. But it's about um, basically about a, a romance between a songwriter and a British museum museum courier, or curator. But um, but I I'm gonna pull this up because there was a there was a quote that I took a screenshot of and it was about songwriting. It's towards the very end of the book mm-hmm. and. Um, okay, yeah. So this is uh, right towards the end. And it's, a re- it's about um, the songwriter, obviously. Mm-hmm. And it says, The truth about autobiographical songs, he realized, was that you had to make the present become the past. Somehow, you had to take the feeling or a friend or a woman and turn whatever it was into something that was over so that you could be definitive about it. You had to put it in a glass case and look at it and think about it until it gave up its meaning. And he'd managed to do that with just about everything he'd ever met or married or fathered. The truth about life was that nothing ever ended until you died. And even then you left a whole bunch of unresolved narratives behind you. He'd somehow managed to retain the, uh, retain the mental habits of a songwriter long after he stopped writing songs. And perhaps it was time to give them up. Mm, I like that. Yeah, and the whole, so what resonated, of course, with me was the whole, because, um, I mean, obviously, I've written about relationships, you know, plenty of times mm-hmm. in my life. And the idea of making make something that isn't definitive at all definitive is a really interesting concept. Mm-hmm. And I then can, the flips, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can definitely relate. I mean, there's, yeah, there's definitely an element of, say a song is about a relationship, say it's fresh, right? And you're sure. full of all these emotions. And there is something for me, at least about putting pen to paper and to melody and, and getting verses out and a chorus out that, that forces me to have some sort of a definitive, definitive stance on that situation. Right. And a lot of times it closes it for me. Like there's a situation once where uh, with the same person twice, actually, where the first time we fell out, I wrote a really great song about it. And, and then I thought, well, you know, this crappy situation happened, but like, oh, but look at the song. And like the song couldn't have been that had that not happened. Right. Because it took that emotion to put it into the song. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, that individual came back into my life. I forgave them and I gave them another chance. And and then the same thing happened. So, the evening that it happened, I literally came home and I sat down at the piano and I was so angry because I thought, oh, this is happening again. Like, how mm-hmm. could I let it happen again? 
And I wrote another song just like that. Yep. And it was another great song. And it stopped me in my tracks and I laughed. I, I was quite sad um, about what happened that evening before, but I, I laughed when I heard the entirety of the song because I thought, you know, may, maybe that's the reason we even ever knew each other is so, you know, sure. that person could raise those emotions out of me and, and make me write something great. You know, (laughs) so after that happened, it's it's almost like I took that entire story, packaged it up into a great track, put it away. And literally like an hour later, I was done with it. Like I never thought about it again. I didn't wake up the next day. And I thought it was very strange because I thought, um, you know, how, how could that just dissolve all of my energy about the situation? But it did. It, It just it all channeled into a song. Um, it was a good song. I put it away and I put away that situation and that person and, and those mm-hmm. emotions. And it, it's, it was odd, but I thought, wow, maybe that was the purpose of that particular, you know, encounter is just to just serve as a, <laughs> as inspiration, I guess. <laughs> I mean, have you ever had, I think of this cause it's this only something I recently or somewhat recently went through, mm-hmm. but, um, or experience, I should say not went through, but where you wrote a song inspired by somebody and because, you know, especially you have to extrapolate a bit, you know, you have to create stories to write the song about Mm -hmm. often. And then that changes your perception entirely. It almost defines this other situation or this other person or what have you. And it doesn't have to be rooted in reality at all, but because you get so close to really, I mean, you're, you're trying to get inspired. So you create these stories in your head and then you realize like, am I delusional? And, um, (laughs) and then did that put this person on an unfair pedestal? Because for instance, you created the story and you created the story because you needed to write, Mm -hmm. but it's not rooted in reality necessarily. Mm -hmm. And that, um, I don't know. I was just wondering if you've ever had, yeah, situations where your writing ended up. Yeah. Really, uh, influencing, the relationship the relationship um i actually would say no because i find that songs for me are really like a vehicle to get the truth across right so i find that i either write from my own life and inspiration or if i do go into say something um, fictitious to my mm-hmm. own life. Um, I would say that I get inspired by films and other oh, people's okay. relationships and TV series. Like one of my favorite songs that I've written was um, inspired by a TV series called Tidelands. It's mm-hmm. an Australian series about um, this like fictional town that you know they find find out that their sailors have been have gone missing for like hundreds of years because there's mermaids in the water, like mermaids are real. And, uh, and then there's always uh, also those, those mermaids um, had children with these sailors before the sailors drowned. So they're like half human. And it was a really, it's a really cool show. And, uh, and the soundtrack for it was incredible. Like I I loved the, uh, the music supervision for, uh, for that series, but I thought it was, missing like almost like a theme song or something like something to tie the entire series together and it just came out of me I wrote it um and uh and so that was like a prime example of when I used someone else's story to kind Mm -hmm. of like fuel my creativity so I, I don't necessarily take characters out of my life and I like I don't superimpose realities onto them or like just to complete a song because I, I feel like I don't feel gratified like inside mm. when that happens mm. for me it's really about like I've got something to say or like this is the right. truth of the situation or if it's uh, if it's more creative, it's like that was the film, that was the relationship in the film, uh, that was the or like say a political situation, and then to get the truth out uh, across and across about that situation or that film or that series, and um, yeah, I would say that I I'm very, I guess uh, 
inspired by the the raw emotions of the truth of a situation, whether mm. it's it's mine or whether it's fictional, but it's like based on a film relationship. There's I, I love exploring the depth of the emotions between characters, whether it's uh, like romantic or political. I like getting to the core of things and then kind of like translating that to music. But it, it does for me, I guess, have to be real in a sense, like sure. either real to me or real to that story, like right. authentic to that story. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, since you brought up film, um, that's a good segue because most people don't know you're also a scenic artist. Mm-hmm. And that is, the, is that the correct term? That is the correct term, yeah. Okay, what is that? So a scenic artist is someone who works with the art director and the production designer on, say, a feature film or an indie film or a TV series. And essentially what a production designer does is they design the look of a set, um, the the look, the colors. The art director um, works with them to kind of translate that to the scenic department and Mm -hmm. the scenic department actually uh, materializes the vision so we're the people who build who paint who sculpt who craft the vision into being from getting you know a picture of it a digital print to -hmm. say like this is this is what i would love this set to look like and we actually make it happen. So we work closely with the carpentry department. The carpenters build the sets, and then the scenics Mm -hmm. go in. They paint everything. They create the textures. They create the paintings. They create the sculptures. And uh, and then the set decorators, that's another department, go in and they dress everything. So they bring in all the furniture and the drapes and the carpets and, like, little statuettes. Um, Although a lot of times uh, the sculptures will be like bigger scale sculptures that are specific to a film, for example, Shazam, Mm -hmm. um, the the comic book film adaptation, uh, we made, I think it was seven or nine, how many, how many sins are there? The seven deadly sins? Seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we made the, we sculpted the seven deadly sins, which were like custom sculptures made for that particular production. Yeah. Right. Right. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Do you find, I mean, a it's fortunate because it's a creative job too. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you're no matter what, you're being creative, whether you're working in the scenic department or you're being a mm-hmm. songwriter. Either way, you know, you're creating. So, do you find that there's there's a parallel between songwriting and the graphic side, or uh, one influences the other? Sometimes, I mean, for me, both always like kind of came together I guess that's why I ended up being both a singer songwriter and a and a visual artist is because when I I grew up in a family with two sculptors and my mother also was a painter as well as a sculptor and I grew up witnessing kind of my parents workflow from day to day and they would put on really beautiful music and you know we'd have like eight, 10 hours of music a day and them just creating in their respective like corners and stuff. And, and I started painting at a very, very young age too. Um, so music was always an element of the process that was always there. Like I, I don't remember ever working in silence. And so I found that as a child, music made me feel such strong emotions yeah. To the point where I would just get mesmerized. And I, I remember very clearly we had this uh, vinyl, like Pink Floyd record. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think my parents liked to start the day with that record. And do you remember you what it the, was? Doom, 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 doom. Oh, <laughs> like, it's Dark Side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and back then, like, I didn't even know English, right? Because I'm an immigrant. Like, I came to Canada when I was 10. Right. Um, so to me, it was just sounds like I, I wasn't even aware at the age of four what they were really singing about because my native language was Russian. Mm-hmm. Um, like I knew a little bit of English, but definitely not enough to to get into the lyrics of it. But uh, but I would 
listen to Pink Floyd and I would listen to a lot of classical music and I would listen to a lot of Italian opera and I mostly focused on the feelings because if, if I couldn't understand what the words meant, I focused on the way the, the sound made me feel. Sure. And so that actually influenced what I was painting or what I was sculpting because music makes me feel such strong emotions that it completely changes my mood. Like if I start sing, uh, listening to sad music right now, I'll at some point in the next You'll five minutes, well, I'll start crying, you know, yeah. like to, to that extent, like I'm an extremely emotional person and music really triggers that in me. Like it takes 30 seconds of a, of a song with really strong, like tragic lyrics to get mm -hmm. me going, you know, physically. Sure. Um, and so during childhood, those two elements were just married together. And then I grew up and like when I was a child, I was a predominantly a visual artist and then music entered my life and I started playing flute and I started learning music theory. And, you know, by the time we arrived at me being 14 years old, music was really something that I wanted to pursue and do professionally. And then bam and they were like oh well you can't really just sing you have to be a songwriter too otherwise you won't make it right like there's no real market for just singers and in the west anyway there are plenty of them um i mean yes and no in, in terms of like you have a lot less power yeah yeah if you can't write your own songs or if yeah. you can't be you know present in the process of songwriting sure. and so for me that was like seriously like it felt completely unfair because I thought like oh well I just learned English like four years ago properly and like how am I supposed to you know think in this language and how am I supposed to write in this language and but I I went at it and I read a lot of books and um slowly but surely um with a lot of you know pain, sweat, and tears, mm -hmm. um, it started happening. And, you know, one day I actually, I wrote a, what I now understand was a great song when I was 15, but I was so hard on myself that I, I thought, Oh, this is terrible. And, you know, I, I played it for someone a year ago and they were like, you wrote that when you were 15. <laughs> like, that's like a, you know, a 50 year old jazz, you know, musician would write that like lyrically, cool. like, right, right. so, uh, not bad for someone yeah. who only had just learned English. I think one of my vices has always been that I, I'm way, way, way too hard on myself. And I think yeah. that comes from my upbringing. And unfortunately, that stopped me a lot in life because I would create something and then I'd think, oh, well, that's that's not good. That's, that's not, not good, good enough. enough. And then 10 years later, realize, oh, it was way beyond good enough. It's just mm -hmm. I didn't have that belief in myself to uh, to really stand behind my own product or stand behind my own uh, creation. Yep. So I guess, you know, we have we all have to overcome challenges. But yeah, those two uh, two elements always for me, like went together, but more so when I couldn't understand words. Right. You know, course. yeah. Is like sound and painting to me are very, um, very similar. But then when you insert lyrics, lyrics are very, um, like well, subjective. And like literal. they, they yeah. li they're literal, right? Yeah. So it it forces your brain to think in a different way. Like when I just play piano or just play around with sounds, it's a completely different part of my brain that's working. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's what I, I. I'm sure it's not, but like that's how I feel. Like I can just go everywhere, and I can you know start splashing paint around, and it somehow like blends in, and you can orchestrate lights to like to work with the sound. And once you insert lyrics, you're brain starts giving literal meaning yes. to these sounds and it becomes different and it, it, it limits you in a way, but also it connects with you deeper. Mm -hmm. It does. So. I mean, yeah, no, I've always found the same. I mean, lyrical lyric writing is so much harder for me than any kind of melody or because unless you write something extremely vague, it becomes definitive. Mm -hmm. And I, I love it when things aren't definitive. I, 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 my whole life lives in the gray area all the time. So mm -hmm. when, if it's completely, especially like, obviously, you know, you could say any words are up for interpretation, usually. But with music or, you know, just instrumental music, there, there is no feeling assigned to that. Or you're not mm -hmm. being told how to feel. Or you're not being told how exactly. the other person felt. It could have, exactly. they could have written the most depressing thing ever and have been in, you know, 
a very happy mindset at the time. Mm -hmm. So you never, I think there's a certain mystery in that, that I really love. There is. And I, I know that, you know, in my family, we always, we always listen to the melody above and beyond anything else. And I, I think it was funny when I, when I started writing, I would bring songs to my mom and I would be like, Hey, do you want to take a listen to this? Or, or, like find songs that I really like that I think are brilliant lyrically, you know, once I could fully comprehend the weight and the brilliance of uh, the art of lyrics. Sure. um, I would bring it to her and she'd be like, yeah, that's all right. I'm like, what do you mean? It's all right. It's like, what do you mean? It's brilliant. She's like, well, I'm listening to the melody and it doesn't really touch me. I'm like, no, listen to the words. (laughs) And so like some people, I, I find that, some people are just trained to to emotionally connect with music through just the melody, right? Mm-hmm. So so you can give them like I I too did not understand the appeal of Bob Dylan for a very long time right. because I was just listening to the melody and to me it kind of felt like well there there's like I'm searching for something to fall in love with but it's not really like touching me right until I actually started listening to the lyrics right and with like a lot of these greats it's it's the message it's how they're able to craft the words the story and i feel like that's something you know songwriters appreciate more rather than the lay person because a lot of people say you know like a lot of people in russia or a lot of people in other parts of the world who maybe don't even know English, they will just listen to the melody. And, and if the mal- right. melody doesn't touch them, if it doesn't connect to them emotionally, they'll skip skip the track. <laughs> I, mean, I was going to wonder if that is a Russian thing. Um, I mean, even not necessarily a, not understanding lyric or English lyrics. Connecting but, uh, to the music? But yeah, just the way they... The way they do, because <sighs> I know it's been said, and maybe it's a Western culture thing, or, you, or United States, and I would say let's look at Western music. But in general, um, and maybe this is outdated now, but it used to be said that women tended to listen to, to lyrics and words mm-hmm. because, um, I mean, women in general, they're much more social than men are. They, You guys are way smarter than us. We're idiots <laughs> when it comes to interpersonal relationships. Yeah. You know, we're still like, you know, let's bang a rock over our head and you'll want to talk about it. Um, but so typically, uh, from what I was understood that women really, in general, they tended to gravitate towards the lyrics, the words, the message. And men more typically gravitated towards the instrumental and the, uh, like the, uh, like the physical feeling of it. And that's, for mm-hmm. instance, that's why, you know, like aggressive music is you know, right. more typical with men than it is women yeah. because it's almost like it's an aggression testosterone thing. And I find that actually, I may be wrong, but I think the, the fan base for things like genres like house and deep house and techno and trance mm-hmm. is predominantly male. I think. Yeah. I'm not so sure. Too. Yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Well, in, in that case, I, I'm, I guess I, I'm more masculine that way. Like I, I need for, I, I need to feel the music. Like I really yeah. need to feel it. Well, you're also a musician. Well, and I think to, to go back to the question you were going to ask, um, if it's a Russian thing, I think any culture that had a very rich history of classical music, yeah. um, I think they are, it's almost like they're con- genetically conditioned to, um, to perceive sound, yeah. you know, to fall in love with sound, to, to not be really tied to lyrics. Cause in middle Eastern culture too, you know, the, the music is like vastly like instrumental in Africa. You've got these great, like drums and beats and, and things being done with sound and, and lyrics. I, I feel like, No, I wouldn't say lyrics are a a modern thing. Obviously, lyrics were originally a way to tell stories, right? Mm -hmm. Like you you have somebody was telling me like in Kazakhstan, where um, where I'm from, originally we have, you know, old men on dombras, like basically rapping. Right. So (laughs) my mom one day was just like, Oh my God, it's, it's like modern rap, but like, you know, a hundred years ago, you have these like old men with 
the felt hats with beards just mm -hmm. sitting at a fire like nomadic tribes and they're they're playing dombras and they're rapping about right. what's happening in society right? right so i i think lyrics yeah lyrics are powerful tools to uh to get a story across and to really touch people were there any songwriters you found particularly influential when you were i guess actually i was gonna say when you first started but even now yes yes the first name that comes to mind is Sting. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, he's so brilliant. Yeah. He's just so brilliant. I don't know. I don't know. He, he's, to me, he's, he's achieved the perfect balance of like artistry of sound mm -hmm. and artistry of lyrics because he's just, I mean, he could read you a book to a song and it would, uh, to a melody and it would sound like a song. Like yeah. he's one of the few people that I've ever listened to that manages to, fit very like complex deep material mm -hmm. into a song that actually feels like a song and not like a you know sermon of some sort or like someone's you know telling you a story and putting mm -hmm. a beat to it or something he's absolutely brilliant and yeah. i that's like one of my biggest dreams as an artist is to to either sit in a session and write with him or to perform with him something mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah Definitely, that was that was a huge inspiration to me. Yeah. Um, before I gained an appreciation for artists like Bob Dylan and sure, um, yeah, I, I was definitely late to Dylan too. Yeah, <laughs> I just I just didn't get it because I don't think I actually. I mean, this goes back to the lyric thing, but I, I would say for the first twenty five years of my life, I knew the lyrics to maybe three songs total. I just didn't, I didn't hear it. And even back when I'd be doing a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. pop vocal editing and stuff like that, I could go through an entire song. I could spend, you know, 12 hours going through this same thing and just the one, the one top line over and over and over. And I couldn't tell you a single sentence. Like I, mm -hmm. I could sing you the melody. I could tell you individual words and like where this one word sounds weird. But as far as like putting together a compound sentence, like I, I just, Mm -hmm. I didn't hear it. And um, and I think, I don't know, I, I, that changed for me probably late 20s. And I think when that's also when I also got more interested in songwriting too. And, and I, I think that's natural. I find in general a lot of, uh, a lot of musicians I've seen when they're younger, they're in a way, you're like you're trying to prove yourself, and you're. I mean, there's certainly there's definitely songwriters who try to prove themselves in songwriting for sure. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of musicians, at least, I feel like a lot of us we were like trying to prove ourselves on a technical level, mm -hmm. and whether that's instrumentation or production or you know flashy guitar solos or whatever. Um, and then you get older and you realize that very little of that actually matters, and the only yeah. thing that actually matters is the song. Yeah. I feel like, and I think that that's what really intimidated me, like in the beginning is I thought, oh, I have to write a great song. What is a great song? Oh, I, you know, on the label side, people were like, well, you have to write a hit. And then you're like, well, what's a hit? So you're constantly looking outside of yourself as a songwriter that's starting out to, to understand what a great song is and mm -hmm. you know these people will tell you that's a song that sells whatever amount of copies and that's a song that's a hit this is a song that has complex lyrics no it's great if it has simple lyrics and the same message can be conveyed like everyone has their own answer for what a great song is and it took me a good decade to like come back to myself and just to, to tune out everybody's noise and advice and realize that a great song is a song that feels good and authentic to myself when I write it. Yeah. Like if I can write something that when singing it back to an audience, I feel completely at peace, like centered and like I got my message out and, and it's well read. Mm -hmm. um, I think that to me is a great song because I, I mean, if you can get pulled for years from like the labels to the real artists and like, you know, people who really get, try to get to the bones of it. And I feel like everyone's looking for a formula. And mm -hmm. as much as there is a formula, there is no formula. 
Yeah. Like it, it's constantly this elusive, like it's, it's like chasing, you know, have you, you have cats, like, have you ever, if you made didn't them? notice one of them was sitting on me for the last 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever made them chase the laser? Yeah, of course. That's like, that's, I feel like that's a good uh, metaphor for what sometimes we're forced to do in the music industry. It's like, you know, they point a laser and then you're just chasing it and you're trying to like pinpoint like what works and what doesn't work. And like, it will drive you crazy. Yeah. And it will make you quit. And at this point, I just realized, like, you know what? I'm I'm secure in my skill set right now to to know that a great song can take many shapes and forms. You yeah. know. I was, and you're primarily independent these days. I mean, mm-hmm. you do do a feature here and there, but for the most part, you don't really do the label game too much. No, because I I stopped. I think I had you know a few years in my when I was a teenager where I was like trying to find out, you know, how to get in with the cool people. Um, And it just, you know, I I went through it all. I went through showing up, like being scouted by labels, showing up in the studio, producers trying to hit on me, producers trying to sleep with me, producers trying to do all kinds of things that had nothing to do with songwriting or artistry or me singing. Mm -hmm. Um, then it was like, well, no, do it this way. And no, no, do I do it that way. But then this sound doesn't match your image. And you sound like this, but you look like that. And it, it was constantly being like pulled and pulled and pulled. And I guess it made complete. It makes complete sense to me why I was so pulled in different directions when I was younger. Because um, I didn't really have a solid sense of who I was. So it was easy to pull me. Not that I ever let anybody pull me to any particular direction, but it just felt really confusing. And it felt like you're hitting a brick wall at like 120 miles an hour every single week. Um, But I, I took small steps. Like I learned how to engineer my own vocals. I, I started reaching out to producers like overseas and because In Canada, our scene is very small and it's very, I guess it's its cliquey everywhere, but it's its not really a game I realized I wanted to play. Mm-hmm. Like, I couldn't care less if, uh, if I was accepted into, like, say, a label in Toronto or, or whatever, because once I stopped caring about that and I started going to places like Russia, I started going to places like Dubai, I started... Um, finding people who were excited to work with me and we we ended up like creating tracks literally out of our closets that ended up getting signed to Armada and to Perfecto and like to all these labels so I kind of went from being an indie artist that was kind of like you know not really considered in Toronto to like jumping 10 steps ahead of everyone else in the game here just by the virtue of the fact and you did this entirely on your own And I did it entirely on my own. I never had a manager. I never had, like, it was literally, it was a lot of legwork in terms of, like, I had to email people, communicate with people, um, organize everything. Like, it it was a lot of work, but you, yeah, it's completely possible to do it on your own. And you have to get excited about it. Because if I ever, you know, sat there and thought, oh, well, you know, um, so-and-so doesn't think I'm good enough or doesn't want to, and it's not, I've never been told ever that I wasn't good enough. Mm-hmm. It was, oh, we're looking for like this right now because this is hot. And like, we don't really know. Or we just signed an artist that like is very similar to you. So we don't want to like saturate our whatever. And like, so I've never had this idea that I wasn't like good enough. It was just either not the right timing or, you know, people wanted you to already be famous with like a hundred thousand fans and then they would give you a chance, which is usually what happens. Um, But I thought, okay, well I'm getting, I'm not getting anywhere here. So I'm going to go overseas. And I did go overseas and I managed to build a career on my own. And then I met more artists and more artists than I met you. And we did great things together. Like it was all, it was all collected piece by piece by piece by piece. And it took a lot of work and it, it, it took honest work. Like I never had the the capital to just pay people to do things for me. Um, I never had a boyfriend who was a producer or a songwriter. Like it was literally just hard work. And 
it wasn't easy. There was a lot of moments where it was just like, seriously, you know, like I've been in projects that I would devote like a year or two of my life to, and I would fly all over the world for them and I would write things for them. And then at the last second, they would like implode for whatever reason that was out of my control. Um, so you really have to be in love with what you do. And you know, this, like you have to just love, you have to love music more than the promise of, recognition or fame like you have to love music so much that even if you create something and no one listens to it you still are like yeah that mm. was awesome this song is great i love it and that's enough for you like once you arrive at that point i feel like you're unstoppable and that's why i feel like right now i'm unstoppable because i've arrived at a point where i just get so much like i i freaking love creating i love collaborating and funnily enough, once I got to that point where I just didn't care about like stepping out of my door and looking for anyone's approval, they all started coming to me. Mm -hmm. Like suddenly press shows up. Like I've never paid for a piece of press in my life. And I had like major magazine interviews, this and that. And like, I've never had to go out and look for it. And I realized it's like once you're centered in yourself and you're just like a hundred percent behind what you do and you just love what you do all that stuff doesn't matter and it shows up anyway like that's a byproduct like a lot of people try to chase the it's like they need to and i and i was one of those people it's like i needed for someone to tell me i was great in order to believe that i was great or to give me permission to make music like you don't need permission you just make it right right yeah and even if you're not that good in the beginning if you consistently work at your craft for like three years, five years, 10 years, you're going to get really good. It's just a natural progression yes. of what happens. You can't stay bad forever. <laughs> you know, I think you like, can, I think that's yeah. highly possible. Yeah. But it's like, if you have that drive, right. Because like, if I, if I think if I saw myself today, like if I was, if I was me 10 years ago and I saw myself today, and how far I was able to come with, like, how easy it is for me to write songs today and yeah. how joyful it is. Because I, I hated songwriting. I did not want to write songs at all because I already knew that it wouldn't be something that I was naturally good at, you yeah. know? Like, so I, I was like, stay away from me. And then it was something I had to do, right? Because I that's how much I love music. It was a, an integral tool. But... Like today, it just feels, it's still a lot of work. Like the legwork is still there. Yeah, of um, But I really love the process. Like we talked the other day and you guys were like, well, you know, projects take a lot of work. And I'm like, I love the work. I love it. Because like I get to do what I love, you know? Like yep. it, it's, it's a joyful thing for me to put in hard work into what I love. Like it's so gratifying. And I feel so lucky to be in a position where I can do that, right? Because I, I, I don't, like, I mean, modesty aside, I already think I'm, I'm, I'm great as a person and as a, I don't know, as an artist. Like, I, I'm, I think I'm at peace with myself and mm -hmm. my skill set. So I, I don't need anybody's, like, validation or, or support and because I am at peace with myself and I'm, I'm confident in what I do is why that support shows up over and over in my life, like without me having to, to look for it. Well, yeah. shiny lights are attractive, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah, that's the thing, like, you mm -hmm. know, 10 years ago, it was kind of like, oh, please pay attention to me. Please help me do this. Please like, please sign me, please this. And it's like. People are not attracted to desperation. People no. can feel when you need something from them, right? Mm -hmm. Like no one wants to be leached of energy for, and, and that's a lot, a lot of times what happens is brand new artists or brand new songwriters who are trying to get in the game. There's just this like strong energy of like, help me, I'm drowning, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> and like, that's, it's not attractive. It's not attractive in personal relationships. Like when you try to be clingy and like desperate, <laughs> it's not attractive in a business relationship. So you got to really like step up your game and deliver that to yourself. And then when people see how shiny you are, like mm -hmm. how happy you are, how like vibing you are with your own material, they're like, oh, maybe there's something there. Yeah. Like, let's check that out. Oh, that person's happy. That person's really like in love with what they do. I want to invest in them. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, I agree. 
entirely. What would, if you were coming up right now, what would you do differently than you did, say, 10 years ago? I would listen less to people I thought were in positions of power. Um, I think I, I was very ignorant of my natural talent in mm-hmm. songwriting and in music. Like I, I knew I was good, but it was sort of like floundering. Like, am I good or do I just want this so bad? And like, sure. um, and I, and I met with a lot of people in the industry that, you know, they were looking at it from a perspective of business. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I did follow the laser pointer. Yeah for a few years back and forth until I just got exhausted. Like I burned myself out and then I was like, well, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to do me. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and yeah, just, I, I would say, but see, it's, it's all in- interconnected, right? Because when you're like 15, 16 years old, you don't, or at least I didn't have a very strong sense of self just because like I had, a I don't think situation. anyone does. I feel like I should have because I had a big career as a child artist, like as a visual artist. Mm -hmm. But the issue is in visual arts, I was always confident because I always like won the prizes and all the competitions and like got my diplomas. Like I was like, I'm good and I know it and it's, it's stable, right? It's not going to run away from me. In music, I didn't have any connections. I didn't. Like I just learned the language. I yeah, you weren't nearly felt as like I had a, I had a ton of competition and I couldn't play instruments yet. And yeah, it, it was mm-hmm. a very like shaky ground. Yeah, of course. And I had this like imposter syndrome of like what, how, but I want this so bad. And 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 yeah. so I listened to a lot of people, some of whom gave me really good advice, and some of whom uh, helped me lead myself astray for a number of years uh but yeah i would just i would just tell myself that i like you're better than you think you are Mm -hmm. you know and when i was 14 and i first bought my little studio equipment set up um instead of feeling like oh well i'm too old like this this was my train of thought when i was 14 and 15 i'm too old to to learn guitar i'm too old to learn how to produce um because i was 14 and 15 yes because i was I was comparing myself because coming from an arts background where I was at the top of the game. So I was like the young, you know, art prodigy. I was now comparing myself to the 15 and 16 year olds that I saw that were signed to like Sony and BMG and and Warner and Universal. And I, I was like, well, I'm sitting at home in front of a computer and they're out like performing on Disney and Nickelodeon. Right. So like the, the rift was so big that it, it, because I was comparing myself to the artists my age at the top of their game, it felt like I shouldn't even try, you know? That's incredibly I, like, young to be that defeated. Yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> incredible. It's I almost, mean, I'm like Benjamin Button. Like, my, my whole inner dialogue, like, changed from the time I was, like, 15 right. to now. It's like, now I'm like, I can do anything. doesn't matter what anyone else, anyone else is doing, right? <laughs> It's just funny to have that kind of expectation at that age because, I mean, like I consider myself a fairly accomplished music producer and I didn't learn how to even start doing music production until I was But it's like you got to 16. You got to imagine like so in the art uh, in the world of visual arts like back in my country before we yeah. moved to Canada, I was like the equivalent to like a young Olympic athlete. Right. right. Okay. So when you're used to being excellent in one field and then you fall in love with something and then you realize you literally have to like learn your ABCs now. Mm-hmm. Right. And you don't even you're not even it's not that you wouldn't win first place. It's it's not you're not even the podium is like 10 miles away from you right now. Right. right, right, right. But I didn't I didn't know how to mentally be in that space. Right. Because all I ever n- knew as a child was success. Right. What was people going, oh my God, you're so talented. Oh my God, you're, you're so good at this. Oh my God, you're the best, right? Like, yeah. and winning this, these national competitions. And so I, I didn't know what, what it was to, to not be good or to have to work hard 
to to accomplish the the minutest of things you know sure. like so that's it was a, a men- a mentally it was like right there. oh it was yeah. <laughs> it was terrible i was crying all the time i was like you know i i fluctuated between like oh my god i'm in love with this and i and i want this so much to like oh my god this is so unfair you know and uh, it's just i i chose another path yeah. and you know i i got demoted to like regular real life where I had to, you know, get a job at a cafe and, and start knocking on doors. And I, I didn't know how to do that. Like I, it was, how, how do you go from like, it, how do you go from fame to, to not, to being nobody and, but to wanting it so badly to just be good at what you love. Right. I mean, so there's a lot of that in Hollywood. So, yeah. uh, I, I don't know. It's uh, obviously it's tough, but I. So the standards, like I set for myself, were like completely unrealistic. Right, right, right. You know, on day one, you're like, "Oh, you're not as good as like Christina Aguilera. You shouldn't even try." <laughs> right, and, and and I get that, and you don't have to be. That's no you one's Christi- like be. the only person who's going to be a, yeah. good at Christina Aguilera, at least at being Christina Aguilera, yeah. is going to be Christina Aguilera. Exactly. So, and, and she was, she has been doing that one thing since she was like three or four years old, sure. right? But she, so it's she's like just as insecure as anybody else, most yeah. likely. But that, but that that's that's exactly it. That that's the comparisons like killed me, right? Like because yeah. when I was a teenager, I was in order to grow, I was trying to find like people to kind of guide me, and it was very difficult to to feel so inferior no because i i wasn't familiar like i i didn't come from a neutral ground so yeah it was it was a journey like it was a journey and that's why i'm so like stoked right now to uh to be doing what i do and to be so at peace with myself and so at peace with the art of it is because i i left all of that behind like it took years and years of working on myself and, you know, kind of coming back to myself and, and seizing all comparisons. Like I don't comparison, compare anything. That's good. That's to that's anything a, anymore. That's a big sign of maturity. Yeah. Cause it, it will kill you. Yeah, it will it, kill your art. It will st- yes. literally stop and freeze you in your tracks. Yes. Completely. Because, because there's how many people are, are there in the world now? Like 9 billion is it nine? Eight, is it nine? I thought it was eight. eight. It's enough. It's enough. Too many. That that there will always be somebody better or more talented or better looking or or have more luck or more money or more opportunities. And it's like if you start, you know, keeping track of like and a lot of artists do. It's it's because we put ourselves out so much. Well, and then our art is like, viewed so, as our validation. Exactly, and your, right? And your art becomes your art is ultimately a, it's you know an extension of you. Yeah. So if someone judges your art and say this is worthless, of course you as a person, it's very right. natural not to feel like you are not worthless. Also. Yeah, it's like you give you put a piece of your heart in everything, and then you give it to people, and you know imagine as a kid everyone <laughs> being like, oh my god, fantastic, yeah. and then you grow up and they're like, eh, I don't even want it, and you're like, what? <laughs> yep. And your whole yeah, it's it's an ego death, but it mm-hmm. has to happen because. If you keep your ego throughout the process, you will literally kill yourself. Yep. Yeah. Well, so what are we doing right now? Or what are you doing? Not we, but you. What's going on now? (laughs) What's going on now? Um, I'm working on a bunch of new songs. I am creating DJ sets because I started DJing last year, which was kind of a dream of mine and I I, for some reason I didn't think I could do it and then slowly and slowly I kind of got pushed into it and I started learning about it and it's fascinating Um, and also I started trying to produce my own I guess house tracks Mm -hmm. and logic and now everything is coming full circle because now you know learning about the structure of a track you now understand like you know you understand DJs better and like how they mix tracks into other tracks that like, for example, uh, you know, a deep house track uh, 
isn't really an entity on its own. It's meant to, you know, come together with other pieces and it's like each track clicks into another track and it's like the, I don't even know how to, like it, it's an overload of information for me, but, you know, sitting there and trying to put the beats together and the bass lines and the, and the toppers and everything, I'm like, ah, okay, I want to give a little more space here so I can then mix that into this portion of that track on my yeah. decks and yeah. and it's yeah it's just blowing my mind like i love the process of like the 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 blood and bones of it like i i've always been interested as in visual arts as in music like i've always been interested in in i guess like being in front of the camera behind the camera like i i'm a vocalist like i'm a singer songwriter first but I love learning about production and I love learning about like, I'm starting to read about sound design, what you're prolific at. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just also fascinating because it's giving you so many tools and those tools are to express, you know, your stories, your emotions. It's all inspiration. God, it's wild. It can just get lost in the screen for like eight. And 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 I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm starting to have more, uh, I guess sympathy for uh, for you guys because I remember sitting in a studio and you're like, my ears are done for today, right? And I'm just getting started. I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, but 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 we've got the rest of the day left, and now I'm sitting there for like seven hours, and I'm like, my ears are done. <laughs> now you understand, anymore. right? Now right. I understand because it's past a certain point, your brain just can't handle it. You're still in love with it, but you just cannot. There's yeah. no objectivity anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're just exactly you're mentally done, and then if no one's if no one has the gun to your head, I usually find when you hit the mark or you hit that point, you just say I'm done for today and let it go, yeah. And you turn it off and you do something else, and you come back yeah. the next day ready to go again. It's yeah, it's it's just God, it's so fascinating, and it's just the possibilities of it, and and also like. I find that to me, a song now feels like a, like a piece of glass, you know, you, you can't make it too thin, too thick. You like, there has to be some sort of a balance. Like everything has to come together in a, an equilibrium. And I'm still like, that's what I'm learning right now. It's like, when is enough enough? When, when have you added too much? When is it time to mm-hmm. strip back? When, when is it? You Usually know? if you taste it, you'll find out. Yeah. That's really the thing. I find is if, yeah. if you take a you take a step back and you you know walk away from the kitchen for five minutes and then you yeah. come back and you're like oh no that was way too much salt and then now the dish is ruined at least with <laughs> music you can like at least mute the channel that was too much salt if you're cooking you just got to yeah. start over yeah so, and it just it blows my mind that you can literally sit down like at a laptop and create something. And, you yeah. know, I can take my Zoom outside and sample a bunch of sounds and make them into something and it's just... It's a world of inspiration yeah. you're coming into. Yeah. Yeah. Then it definitely makes me... Like, I've always appreciated what producers did and do. Um, but now it's just a, a whole other level of, like, wow, the, the work that goes into this, right? Yep. Yep. It's... Uh it's different behind the curtain absolutely mm-hmm. but it's good it's good it's gonna affect your you know in a positive way it's gonna affect your songwriting too yeah it's gonna really this will change everything for you and you also won't be beholden to waiting on other people to execute which is yeah which is the big reason that i wanted to uh to learn how to produce myself is because the one thing that's been a constant like in my career as a singer songwriter um is I'm always in some way dependent Mm -hmm. on somebody else, whether it is, for example, if you, I don't play um, guitar or piano live. So whether it's your instrumentalist, like I'll write on them. I just don't play them live because I want to focus on, on other things, but, um, or the producer or, and, and I find that because, you know, singer, songwriter, uh, I mean, for both, male and female and stuff, but there, there is a sort of a, a tradition 
to both roles where producers tend to be predominantly male. Yeah. I would say 95% probably sure. male. Yeah. <laughs> and vo- vocalists can be male or female, but it's like there there's always this like power dynamic where I've all my life had to deal with men and be being beholden to men and being reliant on men and I'm very I'm a very independent, very kind of like strong person on my own and it, it's been a difficult thing to to come to terms with, right? Because yeah. you're always beholden to someone else's schedule when you are being produced by another person. So yeah. th- this is definitely like the first step for me was starting my own label and putting out my own music on my own label. And this is definitely like, a, a, you know, a major step. And this is the next gaining. step. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm excited for you. I look forward to hearing what you do. Yeah, me too. Well, Ordinary Love is out now. That is featuring the lovely Denise Reno. So please, everyone, go listen to it. Uh, if you have any final words, by all means, now's your time. Thank you. Great. Thank you for, uh, for your friendship and for our collaborations. And uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to see what we come up with next. Well, back at you. You know I love you. So, all right, everybody. Take care. Go look up Denise, and we'll see you next time. Denise Reno, everyone. Go check her out on the interwebs, and go check out our new single, Ordinary Love, and even newer. The Crystal Method is dropping the Crystal Method remix of Ordinary Love this Friday. So keep your eyes peeled, stay tuned, and I'll see you next week.